You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 23rd, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Basics of Allergen Immunotherapy. Our presenter is, yours truly, Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics in the section of allergy, asthma, and immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Conferences Online Allergy from beautiful downtown Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Today is, what what is today? Today is uh, September 23rd, 2019, and we're going to be, I'm going to be giving both of the conferences today. It's a beautiful morning out. The weather was just fantastic. It's in the, it was in the 60s. Pollen count is really high, which is great for allergists, bad for allergy sufferers. Sorry about that, you allergy sufferers. <laughs> um, the allergy season is in full swing, and uh, happy Peak Week. This is the first day of Peak Week. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Who knows what Peak Week is? I, I think I mentioned that last Friday. Do you know what Peak Week is? I don't know. No, okay. So Peak Week is the 38th week of the year. And it's the peak week for asthma exacerbations. More people have exacerbations of asthma on this week than any other week of the year. And that's true throughout the northern hemisphere. Uh, In the southern hemisphere, it's actually uh, six months offset because of a different season. We don't know why peak week is what it is. It's just, uh, just the way it is. Maybe someday somebody will figure that out. Uh, what it means is that if you have asthma, it's a good idea to pay attention to how you're doing. If you're having symptoms, make sure that you're using your controller medicines and that you have all of the, uh, the things that you need in order to control your asthma. So stay well out there. We're going to talk about a topic today that um, uh, involves prevention of some of these conditions. It's called immunotherapy, and this is probably the topic that's most uh, relevant to what allergists do. It's, it's kind of a unique thing because allergists do this and others don't, uh, allergen immunotherapy. Um, so let me uh, pull up my slides. We're going to be talking about immunotherapy today, and, and we've had a few topics on this, but you can never have too much information about immunotherapy. It's what allergists do. It's what is kind of unique to allergists. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, these are my learning objectives. So let's dive right in. Um, Allergen immunotherapy has been around since uh, 1906 when Noonan Friedman first did allergy skin testing and then they uh, they started injecting people with uh, small amounts of the things that they were allergic to. That, that's not on this slide. Uh, just pointing out that it's been around for a really, really long time. Um, but it was kind of, uh, it wasn't standardized, it was, it was the Wild West. Pretty much, if you, if you fi- found 10 different allergists, they gave allergy shots in 10 different ways. It was, it was a chocolate mess. <clears throat> the way I was taught to do allergy shots was different than the way other allergists were taught, and each training program taught their fellows how to do allergy shots in kind of an idiosyncratic way. Um, that, that was unacceptable, and when the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters was formed, one of their charges was to standardize the practice of medicine and allergy. And so um, one of the big challenges was allergen immunotherapy. The reason that was such a big challenge is because every allergist knows how to do it, and they were right and everybody else was wrong. Uh, so getting everybody together and having them agree to compromise and do it in a consistent way was, was not a very easy task. It's like herding cats to the cliche that's become overused. Um, so in, ni- in 2003, the first practice parameter on allergen immunotherapy was uh, published. Uh, allergen extracts were defined as diagnostic. Uh, they, uh, maintenance concentrate was defined as a vaccine. That's the thing you, in- you actually inject into the patients. Uh, an estimated uh, effective dose was finally estimated. We, we, I mean, you couldn't really tell what the dose should you try to give to a patient in order to be effective. So this was the first attempt to really try to estimate that. And then labeling was standardized. Uh, If a private 
if a primary care doctor receives extracts from three different allergists who each label it differently, it's very confusing and increases the risk that something wrong will be administered. Um, the, the allergy practice parameters were initially met with uh, skepticism and then with great fanfare because there was a great need for standardization of allergen extracts. Um, by 2007, uh, a second update was published. Uh, instead of vaccines, they were all called allergen immunotherapy extracts. Effective doses were further defined. Uh, Cross-reactivity patterns were refined. So if you uh, had two pollens that were very similar, no reason to give both of them. Just give one and the other. it would stand for the other. Uh, compatibility was refined. Some extracts are more compatible with each other when you mix them together. Uh, patient files rather than off the board, we'll, we'll talk about what that is. And then standardized forms for skin testing and prescriptions were recommended in the uh, practice parameter. The third practice parameter was subsequently published in 2010, and this is just the cover page for that. Um, New indications for immunotherapy were described. Uh, we, we knew that allergen immunotherapy was recommended for nasal allergies and for asthma, um, but atopic dermatitis was questionable, and there was some clear evidence that it was effective for some cases of atopic dermatitis. Also, if you have a large history of large reactions to stinging insects, uh, you can reduce those reactions. It's not being used to prevent it. Usually it's used to prevent anaphylaxis, but if you uh, are a beekeeper, for example, or you're in the military and you're exposed to venom, venomous insects and your reactions are incapacitating, this can reduce that. Uh, there was also a recommendation for measuring baseline tryptase in venom immunotherapy, and I think Dr. Golden either will or has talked about that. And then no, no specific lower limit if the indications are present for age. So you, you, you can give it at any age, but if you're giving it to somebody, especially if it's an elderly person, you need to evaluate the risk and benefit. They have to be able to survive anaphylaxis if they should have it. And then they also recommended that a 30-minute wait was advised because the wait time hadn't really been standardized before that. So what are the indications for allergy immunotherapy? Um, basically, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. You have to have allergies. It affects your nose and your eyes. Uh, Allergen-induced asthma, atopic dermatitis, uh, hymenoptera, and fire ant hypersensitivity, which is redundant because fire ants are hymenoptera, but just to specify that. Most people don't know that ants are part of the hymenoptera order. Food allergy, not so much. There, there is some evidence for food allergy, and in fact, it probably would be a very effective treatment, but there was an, uh, an, an, a death during a clinical trial of food allergy about 20 years ago, and, and that really put a, a pall on the whole research of allergen immunotherapy for food allergy. I think that's unfortunate because we might have a very good treatment for food allergy today had that not occurred. Because it occurred, nobody is willing to do research on allergy shots for food allergy. And then there's always these questions of mosquitoes and autoimmune disorders. Do we use immunotherapy for that? And, and the answer is no. Uh, in mosquito, uh, first of all, mosquitoes don't cause anaphylaxis. Even if you're allergic to it, it, it is possible to be allergic to mosquito bites. Uh, and, um, uh, and in immunotherapy extract with mosquito, Saliva does not exist, and if it did, it could be a great factor for viral infections and other transmitted diseases, so probably not a good idea. That, that could be changed in 10 years, who knows? But right now, it's not recommended. Um, the uh, Office of Inspector General audited a group of allergists about 15 years ago to see whether, when they were writing their prescriptions for immunotherapy, they indicated why the patient had an indication for it. Um, I don't know of any disease that the OIG inspects, but for some reason they decided to inspect this. That's because the practice parameter listed what the indications were, so then they knew what to look for. Most diseases don't have indications, so you don't know what to look for. Um, because of that warning that they gave to allergists, we decided that it was a good idea to list why are you putting somebody on immunotherapy, what are the indications. And so when patient here is put on immunotherapy, it's a good idea to fill out this form and to list what the indications are. And they're listed here. They're in the practice parameter. There are contraindications, too, reasons why you would not 
treat somebody with immunotherapy. Uh, basically, if they have unstable asthma, you can't use immunotherapy to stabilize their asthma because they're, they're at increased risk of anaphylaxis. So you've got to get the asthma under control first, and then you can give immunotherapy. If they have coronary artery or other heart disease, it might make it less likely they would survive anaphylaxis, which is a known risk of immunotherapy, then maybe you at least you know, think twice before recommending it for such individuals. And then there's always this uh, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. It's, it's not an absolute contraindication. You can treat people who are on these drugs with immunotherapy, but there are issues related to it. In, in particular, if they have anaphylaxis, it may be more difficult to, to treat them. Immunotherapy is one of those conditions where we recommend informed consent. Um, the patients um, really need to know what they're doing. If you don't tell them all of the nuances of immunotherapy, then they, they, they're not going to be compliant. And if there's a bad reaction, they're not going to be happy with you and, and so on. So um, basically, consent should include what the treatment is, the alternatives, which include not getting immunotherapy. Uh, the benefits and the risks, the costs, uh, nobody wants to be surprised by paying for stuff that they didn't expect to pay for. How long they're going to take it. Immunotherapy is a three to five year commitment. If you tell people that, they're usually surprised. They think it's one shot and you're done. No, it's three to five years. If they're not willing to put, a, put in that type of commitment, they may not be a good candidate for immunotherapy. Uh, and then any specific office policies that may affect treatment, what's your office hours, whether you want them to wait for 30 minutes, should they have EpiPens with them, that, that kind of stuff. So it's a good idea to give them all of that information before they start on immunotherapy. It's true for any medical procedure for which there's an increased risk of a bad outcome. And we have a consent form here at Children's Mercy that patients fill out. Immunotherapy modulates your immune system, so it's not desensitization, it's not a temporary thing, it's actually a long-term investment in changing your immune response to allergens. Um, it, increases, it, it, it decreases the specific IgE to the allergens that you're injecting into the patient, increases specific IgG4, which is the antibody that's a good marker for effectiveness of immunotherapy. It switches from this Th2 to Th1 phenotype. Th2 is the atopic allergic phenotype. Uh, we were trying to switch them to a non-allergic phenotype, which would be more of a normal immune response. And that's what immunotherapy can achieve. It alters mediators. Inter IL-4, 5, and 13 are the big atopic mediators. It switches them to more of an IL-2 interferon gamma type of pattern. And then it reduces the sensitivity of the target organ so the patient is less sensitive to the allergens. And this is the time span. It, initially, um, the IgE goes up and then it goes down, uh, which I always thought was fascinating. You actually become a little bit more allergic before you become less allergic, so that, that kind of window of vulnerability. But then gradually your IgG4 increases and then you become immune to the thing you're allergic to. It works. Uh, this is an old study, 2007 Cochrane Review. There, there have been many studies since then, but not a lot of Cochrane Reviews. 51 clinical trials, uh, statistically significant reduction in symptom scores and in medication scores for allergic rhinitis. The patients not only have fewer symptoms, but they can use fewer medications. And, and it turns out, as we'll show later, it's a sustained improvement. If, if, if you get better and then you stop the allergy shots and they get worse again, what have you really achieved? But if you can give them the allergy shots and then they have sustained improvement, then it's, it's beneficial. And you can see that the odds ratios are very favorable towards immunotherapy. Uh, most of the uh, immunotherapy uh, studies were done in house dust mites, but there have also been immunotherapy studies done for other allergens too, and we'll go through those uh, during this, uh, this presentation. Um, what about uh, progression to developing asthma? Wouldn't it be nice if immunotherapy could use to prevent developing asthma? We're writing a paper about that right now. Uh, the biggest study was in the prevent uh, asthma with treatment, the PAT study done in Europe, uh, done in the 19, late 1990s and early 2000s. And it turns out that patients who get specific immunotherapy, that's what SI stands for. Uh, when you give that to them, 
uh, the patients are much less likely to develop asthma than patients who receive placebo. So there is not only a treatment effect, but there's a preventive, a preventative effect, uh, primary prevention for developing asthma. Okay, when we give immunotherapy, we're giving shots of something. What are we shooting? What are we giving shots of? We're giving them extracts. Um, extracts are uh, basically um, uh, solutions that contain allergens that have been extracted from uh, source materials like pollens and molds and furry animals and stuff like that. Uh, standardized extracts are preferred. It's nice to know what you're administering instead of just guessing. Um, the labeling of the potency units for standardized extracts, there's several different potency units. The most common one is the bioequivalent allergy unit, or BAU. Um, you'll notice that some extracts, like dust mites, come labeled as allergy units, or AU, and there's a historical reason for that. And then some of them are just li listed in terms of the major allergen. Ambe-1, Ambrosia artemisifolia is the major allergen of ragweed. And you can measure how many micrograms per gram of that major allergen is in ragweed, and that, that's another label of potency for a standardized extract. Um, extracts that are standardized include cat, dust mite, ragweed, grass pollens, and hymenoptera. And there haven't been a lot of new ones that have been standardized. The standardization process, it's not really clear how you standardize an extract. It's a very difficult procedure. There's not a lot of funding for it, and so it's just been a very difficult thing. And as a result, there's just not been a lot of progress in in the field of standardization of extracts. But when extracts are standardized, it's best to use those kinds of extracts. Non-standardized extracts vary widely in their biologic activity. So some are more consistent than others. And ideally, if you measure allergens, you want them to be clinically relevant. Um, so there are different kinds of extracts. There's aqueous extracts, uh, extracts that are, have allergens in water. Um, most aqueous extracts are stabilized using 50% glycerin. Glycerin stabilizes the extracts so that the allergens don't decay over time. 3% uh, human serum albumin is also commonly used in allergen extracts for injection. Uh, glycerin is very irritating. If you inject somebody with 50% uh, glycerin, it will cause pain and inflammation in the site of injection. Um, so 3% HSA also stabilizes it and is not irritating. Uh, most uh, allergen extracts are for injection immunotherapy have some HSA, but they also have a little bit of glycerin too just because you need an, that stabilizing effect, but, may, may, but usually not 50%. Now, there are also allergoids. Allergoids are basically denatured extracts. So if I take ragweed and I treat it with formalin, that will denature the, uh, the protein so it doesn't bind to the IgE molecule. I can inject you with it and you won't have an allergic reaction, but it still has the T cell peptides which cause the immune response. So it's effective, but it doesn't cause an allergic reaction. So allergoids are very popular. They were, uh, they're not available in the United States, but they were available in, they're available in Europe widely. And the FDA wouldn't approve them here because you can't skin test with it, and that's the, the nature of how extracts are standardized is skin testing, so just a technicality. Polymerized extracts are also something that can be done. If you take ragweed and you polymerize it, you take a million or a thousand ragweed molecules and make them into a great big clump. Um, using trichloroacetic acid uh, or some other uh, polymerizing agent, uh, then, then you can inject that. You're getting lots of allergen, but only a small number of them are on the outside where they can bind to IgE. So it's less allergenic, but more immunogenic. Uh, T-cell peptides, what if we get rid of all of we we break the allergen apart and just use the, the decapeptide that binds to the T cells that causes the immune response. That's been looked at for cat allergen, for example, and there's a lot of uh, progress being made in, in that field now. It's, it's been a long time in coming, though. And then you can add adjuvants like immunostimulatory sequences and uh, the Freund's adjuvant, things like that, that make the extract more allergenic, so it bec it's more effective. Okay, the most common units that we use to measure potency of extracts are weight per volume, and you'll see when you uh, give a patient an, a, an allergen injection of alternaria, for example, it comes as a 1 to 10 or a 1 to 100 weight per volume. What does that mean? That, that means number of grams per milliliter of extract. So if I take one gram of pollen and put it in 100 cc's of buffer, then it's a 1 to 100 extract. That's literally all it means. 
doesn't mean that uh, one gram of stuff gets dissolved, and it doesn't mean all the stuff that got dissolved is allergens. There's a lot of non-allergenic stuff that gets dissolved. Uh, so it really just tells you how the extract was made rather than what was in it. Um, but when you uh, do this for certain pollens like ragweed, it, it usually extracts pretty consistently. So one next one batch is similar to another batch. So for pollens, at least, it's pretty consistent. If you're talking about cat pelt, well, not so much. How do you? How do you can make that consistent? Um, what if you measure the amount of protein in the extract? You can do protein nitrogen units. This is the number of milligrams of protein per milliliter. Uh, that's telling you what actually got dissolved. The problem is not all of the proteins are allergens, and not all of the allergens are proteins. So again, it doesn't tell you about the biologic activity, but, but it's at least telling you what got dissolved in the extract when you extracted it. Allergy units is interesting. It's a uh, it's a measure of potency of reference files at the FDA. Uh, long, I guess in the 1990s, um, the FDA commissioned the production of thousands of little vials of, of dust mite extract. And these were lyophilized, freeze-dried, put in little vials, and kept at minus 80 in the FDA. And the FDA defined each of these vials as 100,000 allergy units. It's an arbitrary unitage. Why 100,000? Because most allergists make fourfold dilutions when they give allergy shots. And if you make fourfold dilutions of 100,000, you get one. And they didn't want to have to deal with fractions. <laughs> That's literally the reason why it's 100,000. <laughs> Go figure. Um, so it could have been a million. It could have been 1,000. Who knows? Uh, it doesn't mean that 100,000 of any specific thing. That's just what the extract is. So when a company makes a new batch of dust mite, they would order the reference file from the FDA and compare their extract with the FDA's reference extract and then label the potency of the, the new extract. Um, the problem with that is, you can imagine what the problem with that is. Uh, after enough of those new batches were produced, the FDA runs out of little vials of extract. And then they have to make a whole bunch of new vials of extract, which aren't necessarily exactly the same as the old vials. And so suddenly the, the unitage changes. And that's what happened. It became very confusing. The FDA still does it this way for dust mite. They're still labeled in allergy units. They keep little vials at the FDA, but they allow the company to create a secondary reference in-house and to use that for a long period of time. It allows the, the primary references to last longer. Historical thing. Bioequivalent allergy units is the potency of extract that gives a 50 millimeter erythema in allergic individuals. It's 25 millimeters in each direction. So you add up the, both the perpendiculars and they add up to 50 milliliters. And whatever uh, the potency of a reference of the vial that gives 50 millimeter ex erythema, that's defined as, the, uh, by, as a certain number of bioequivalent allergy units. It's the ID50 method. Uh, micrograms of major allergen, you can just measure that using immunoassays. And then histamine equivalent prick is common in Europe. It's the, uh, it's the concentration of allergen that gives the same wheel size as a 10 milligram per mil solution of histamine. And you can compare the two. And that's, that's an interesting way of doing it. OK. Uh, when I mention major allergens, we need to define what that is. Um, major allergens, you probably have heard this already, is the first three letters of the genus and the first letter of the species of the source material. And then they're numbered in order of when they were discovered, or in some cases, in order of importance, usually in order of discovery. So for example, the major allergen of Felis domesticus. What, what's Felis domesticus? Do you know? Cat. 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 So what's its major allergen? LD1. LD1. Excellent. Cat. What about Canis familiaris? What's that? Dog. It's dog? OK. What's its major allergen? Can. Can F1. Why isn't it Canis domesticus? I don't know. It should be, but it's not. <laughs> I didn't make up these names. Somebody else did. What is Dermatophagoides farinae? Dust mite. Dust mite. Dermato is skin, phagoides is eating, they are skin-eating farinides. They're from the planet Farinai. <laughs> Sounds like a Star Wars. Dur, dur F1, uh, dust mite. Uh, Ambrosia artemisifolia. Ragweed. Ragweed? This is in the air right now. It's Ambe1. What's Lilium perenae? 
I mean, it's a perennial, it's perennial, but lilium, what is lilium? Any thoughts? No? No. <laughs> well, its major allergen would be lull P1, whatever it is. It's actually ryegrass. Oh. What about Quercus alba? Something white, alba yeah. means white. White ash? Quercus? Birch. It's oak. Oak. Quercus is oak. It would be QA1. Moose musculus? Uh, mouse. Mouse. Moose M1. My favorite, Erectolagus ridiculous. <laughs> Say that three times real fast. <laughs> What is an erectile? I've got a pet erectilagus caniculus. What do I have? <laughs> Prairie dog. <laughs> Guinea pig? It's a wabbit. Oh, no. <laughs> you have to say it that way. It's a wabbit. <laughs> the R is silent. It turns into a W. It's R-A-C-1. And then, of course, Bostaris. Cow. It's cattle. Cow is a female cattle. It's cattle. Okay, not fun. <laughs> Get to work. <laughs> okay, major clinically relevant aeroallergens. Uh, indoor aeroallergens, of course, are the cat, Felis domesticus, dog, um, dust mites, and insects. Uh, German cockroach is uh, Blatella germanica, and American cockroach is Periplanata americana. Periplanata means around the planet. So it's everywhere. Not just in the, not just for America. <clears throat> okay, what kind of extracts do we use? Well, you can use off the board. Uh, this is how I was trained. What is off the board? In the in the New England area, this is still commonly used. Basically, uh, you have a whole bunch of little vials uh, of all the different allergens and the patient. You know what they're allergic to, and you take a single syringe and you stick it into the first vial and you draw up 0.2 and take it out and you stick it in the next file and you drop another point two and you just kind of mix all of them together in one syringe and then the patient stick it in the patient's arm that's off the off the board and you do that when the patient arrives and you give a single injection with all of that stuff okay so they're not mixed together until you mix them together um, what's the problem with this cross contamination yeah what if what if I stick it in and it sucks it down because there's a vacuum now, they're all contaminated. And the needle gets dull. And every time you have to measure something, there's a risk of measuring it incorrectly. And then you have errors of administration. So uh, this, this was discouraged by the Joint Task Force, but some allergy practices in New England got really angry and started sending nasty emails to me about that because they insisted that's how they must do it. Because after all, the vials then turn over very quickly, and so they're always fresh, and you can adjust it for each patient. What if they're reacting to the ragweed? You can give less ragweed that week. And there's a lot of flexibility, so there, I can see that point, but there's a lot of downsides, too. Uh, shared single vials, multiple syringes used in each vial. So if I have, instead of doing each tree, like the off the table, I can just have a mixture of like 11 trees and just you know, suck that up. At least it's not 11 injections, now it's just one. Uh, so separate vial syringes for each vial, but m multiple injections are given, but, but actually the patients can share the vials. So the, the 11 tree mix might not belong to a single patient, but multiple patients can use it. Shared mixtures. Common mixtures are prepared, including all the dilutions. They're drawn from the shared vials when the patient arrives. It's kind of the same type of thing, except all the dilutions are made. And then there are patient-specific vials, which is what we recommend. Instead of having shared vials, each patient gets their own vial labeled just for them, prepared just for them with the stuff that they need. And that's called patient-specific vials. Uh, ideally, you want to pair, use patient-specific files, individualized to each patient. It needs to have identifiers, um, their name, their birth date, their medical record number, all of the useful stuff. Reduces the likelihood of error and the likelihood of cross-contamination. It, it should include an effective dose for each thing in the vial. Uh, you want to avoid mixing incompatible extracts. If one extract denatures another one, you don't want to put them together because they're going to be sitting together for a while. And you want to include, you want to avoid you know, cross-reacting allergens. A single allergen can represent all of the cross-reacting epitopes. Okay, there's a build-up phase, 
and then there's the maintenance phase. The buildup phase involves administering increasing quantities of allergen vaccine subcutaneously. Uh, so you just start with a very low dose, and then over a period of time, you gradually increase the dose into, as the patient develops tolerance. Uh, there's different ways of doing this. There's a conventional once a week. Sometimes people will come in twice a week and get one injection each time. Um, you can have them come in more frequently, as often as daily if you want to, although most people don't have the time. Although I must say on college campuses, if the student health center is near the classes you take, sometimes stopping in once a day is a reasonable approach. So it's something to think about. Cluster. You come in and you get one injection, you hang out for 30 minutes, you get another injection, hang out another. As long as you're making the trip to the doctor, get two or three injections. It's a lot more convenient. You can build up faster that way. It's called cluster. And then rush is just, as it says, it's a very rapid injection schedule. So you start with the very low dose, and then over a period of time, you increase the dose, and then you spread it out once you get to a maintenance dose, maintenance phase. Most commonly used, it's one to two times per week. Uh, average takes three to six months to build up to a maintenance dose. Uh, the schedule basis on sensitivity can, if they have symptoms that are increased or they lapse, they, they miss doses, or they have a reaction or something, you can always modify the schedule depending on what they need. And you need to reevaluate the patient every six to 12 months to make sure that the allergy shots are working and that they're not having problems with it. Now, Russian cluster is an accelerated schedule, and patients may find these to be more convenient, and, but there is a greater risk of allergic reactions to these accelerated schedules. So the advantage is convenience. Uh, the duration of weekly, and visits, weekly visits is shortened. Uh, adherence is improved. So the benefit may occur faster if you get up to a maintenance dose more quickly. And the safe safety uh, in the number of vials being used is reduced. Once you get to the maintenance dose, there's only one vial, so you don't have all four different vials with different concentrations that you might accidentally use. Uh, the disadvantage is that there may be a higher risk of systemic reactions, and uh, there, you have to spend more time each time you come in because you're doing more stuff. So people who have a hard time reaching a maintenance dose on weekly schedules sometimes do better with uh, uh, coming in more, more frequently. Uh, whose schedule doesn't allow them to come in every week for a long period of time. They, they travel a lot or, or whatever. And uh, asthmatics who can't be adequately controlled, sometimes if you just really hit them hard, steroids and high-dose inhaled steroids and all that stuff, you can get them controlled and work really hard at it for a short period of time. You can build them up to a maintenance dose, and then maybe they can stay controlled. Cluster. Uh, for premedication, so because there's an increased risk of a systemic reaction, for cluster immunotherapy, usually recommended patients take an H1 blocker, H2. It's not really clear whether that helps, but some practices recommend that. Uh, it doesn't, not clear, but it really helps that much, but it makes us feel better and we're doing something. For rush immunotherapy, there's really been some studies that looked at it, and it turns out that if you're going to give a patient rush immunotherapy, you need to pre-treat them with an H1 and an H2 and a corticosteroid for three days, and some also add a leukotriene modifier, uh, and uh, these have been shown to reduce the risk of having a systemic reaction in rush immunotherapy. This is a schedule for cluster. You see they come in on visit one, they get a shot, they wait 30 minutes, they get another shot wait 30 minutes, they get a third shot, they come home, they go home, you know, a few days later they might come back, oh, maybe a week later. The schedule is extremely variable in terms of how frequent the visits are, but they get in clusters of shots each time they come in for a visit. That's called cluster immunotherapy. This is a rush schedule. <clears throat> Six hours, they're on a maintenance dose. That, that's really fast. You can see why there's an increased risk of systemic reactions, and, and these patients do have systemic reactions, so they're, they're in the clinic the whole time. There's an IV going. You're watching them. The epinephrine's already drawn up, ready to, to go, or the auto-injector is ready, and, and, and you have to use it fairly frequently. But they really do get up to a maintenance dose pretty quickly. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. So this is kind of the meat and potatoes of the of the presentation today, we're going to write a prescription for an allergy shot, and we're going to have a therapeutic dose of each of the ingredients in this extract. 
Um, so let's assume that this patient has a positive skin test to each of these allergens. And let's assume further that we have reason to believe that these are clinically relevant, that they have symptoms when they're exposed to these things. We want to give them an allergy shot that contains each of them. How do we prepare that extract? Okay, it's a good question. Okay, well, we have to know what we've got to work with. We've got these extracts. Uh, we've got cat hair and pelt. There's either 5,000 or 10,000 bioequivalent allergy units per mil. That's the potency of uh, of cat allergen. There's dust mite. Dust mite comes in a variety of sizes and shapes. There's 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, and 30,000 allergy units per mil. Uh, Bermuda grass comes as 10,000 BAUs per mil, short ragweed comes either as unstandardized or standardized 100,000 allergy units per mil. Uh, other grasses, 10 and 100,000 BAU per mil. Uh, the other pollens and molds are unstandardized, so for the most part they come between 1, and, 1 to 10 and 1 to 40 weight per volume or 10,000 protein nitrogen units per mil, although molds can come in a more concentrated form. This is what we have to work with, and different companies will have different extracts. This may be a little out of date. I didn't go to the extract catalog this year to see if, it, if there are new ones available, so some companies may offer other extracts than what's on this slide. But just for argument's sake, for illustrating the purpose of this discussion, let's say this is what we've got to work with. Well, how much do we need to give? Uh, well, for dust mite, the label potencies are here, and the probable effective dose is between 500 and 2,000 allergy units. That's not allergy units per mil. That's allergy units. That's dose delivered. Remember, dose delivered equals concentration times volume. So it's allergy units per mil times number of mils. If you give one milliliter, then the concentration equals the dose. If you only give a half a mil, then you're only delivering half of the dose of the concentration. So just keep that in, in mind. And these are the probable effective dose ranges. Um, it's possible that other doses are effective, but clinical trials have been done showing that doses in this range is effective. It's good to know. We're going to do some math. It's morning. Sorry. <laughs> I know. Math is hard. It's not hard. It's very easy. Uh, concentration times volume equals dose. Just keep that in mind. If you have a 10,000 BAU per mil extract and you give a half a cc of that, then you're really only giving 5,000 bioequivalent allergy units dose. Keep that in mind. What about weight per volume? What's that? 1 to 100 weight per volume. I said that's one gram in 100 cc's, which is 10 milligrams per mil, right? So 1 to 100 times 0.5 equals 5 milligrams, okay? If you're giving 0.5 milliliters of this, you're giving 5 milligrams. That's how much you're giving of a non-standardized, okay? A few other things. If you have X milliliters of an antigen and you add it to a mixture with a final volume of Y milliliters, the final concentration equals the initial concentration times X over Y. It's just ratios, basically. If I have 0.5 milliliters of a 1 to 10 elm, and I put that into a vial that has 5 milliliters, well, 1, 0.1 is 1 over 10. It's, it's, okay. I mean, 1 to 10. 1 to 10 is 1 over 10. Whenever you see a colon, just substitute that for a dividing sign. It's 1 over 10. And then... 0.5 milliliters is the X, and the total volume is Y is 5 milliliters, and so 1 over 10 times that equals 1 over 100, okay, or 1 to 100 instead of 1 to 10. So you're making a tenfold dilution, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, well, we've got elm, maple, and ragweed, and we want to put all of that into an extract. We're going to inject 0.5 cc's into the patient, and we want the volume of the vial to be 5 cc's. It could be 10 cc's. We're going to call it 5 just for argument's sake. You've got to call it something. Okay, and this is weight per volume. When I say 10, it's, it's really 1 to 10. There's a colon there. So 1 to 10 weight per volume, and we want to know how much to add to the extract. So how do we figure this out? Um, 
So how much how much ragweed should we add? Here's the data. The data was for rag, how much ragweed to add to get an effective dose was actually done in the 60s by uh, by Phil Norman and his colleagues at Johns Hopkins. So this is really old stuff, but it's still valid. Uh, so basically, they used the antigen E, which is AMBE1, placebo, uh, or placebo, and then they uh, gave, they, or they gave uh, the total equi aqueous ragweed extract. The question is, can you give just a purified allergen, or do you have to use the mixture? Uh, so they, they, they gave patients all three of these. It was a randomized controlled study. The green dots is the pollen count. And as you can see, the symptoms go up when the pollen count goes up. And in this particular study, nobody got better. It really didn't work. So that was disappointing. So then the next year, uh, they did it again. And this time, they increased the dose of antigen E and aqueous extract. Um, and it actually worked. Better. There was a difference between the placebo group up here and the antigen E, the MBA1, and the uh, whole pollen extract. Uh, so whole pollen and MBA1 was effective and placebo was not. And you can see that. But there was no difference between these two. So then they increased the dose even more. And by 1968, you could actually see that aqueous extract worked better than if you just gave AMBE-1. It makes sense. There are allergens besides AMBE-1 and whole ragweed extract. So giving those other so-called minor allergens seems to confer additional benefit. And in fact, a dose response curve was generated by all of these studies from 1964 to 68. And you can see that the symptom scores decreased in the active group, not in the placebo group, as the dose of extract went up. And this is in protein nitrogen units. Higher doses work better, and whole extract is better than in purified allergen. OK, so that's the source of information for ragweed. And uh, so let's, let's, let's do the math. It works. <sighs> OK, so for ragweed, we have a 1 to 10. Uh, that's weight per volume. So that's one gram per 10 milliliters of extract, which is 100 milligrams per mil. Okay. We want to give 0.5 cc's, and we want uh, per injection. And the whole vial has five milliliters, which means that there are 10 doses of ragweed in the in the vial. Okay. So 10 doses, and um, we want to give 2.5 milligrams per dose is 25, because 2.5 milligrams is the effective dose that we have projected from the effective dose. Uh, so we need to add 25 milligrams to the total vial. 25 milligrams, but our extract contains 100 milligrams per mil. We saw that up here, which means 0.25 milliliters of this extract, of this maintenance, of this manufacturer's extract in order into the vial in order to uh, deliver the correct dose to each patient when we give them their allergy shot. And so that's what this shows. This is 0.25 cc's of elm, 0.25 of maple, 0.25 of ragweed. Each of these are unstandardized, so we're just assuming that they're all going to be the same. And the total vial is 5 cc's, so you can see that this kind of takes up some space in the 5 cc's. That's what I'm illustrating here. But there's still a lot of space for more allergens to go in there. Okay, Can you, are you following this? It's a little confusing. We'll do it again. Oh, and by the way, once you've done this, you don't have to do it each time. Once you know how much to add, just put it in a little chart and just add that amount each time, and then you don't have to redo the math. Just do the right math the first time. <laughs> okay, what about um, patients who uh, have grass, uh, grass allergy? Uh, so here's a study. These are old studies. So by the way, the efficacy studies for allergy shots were done a long time ago and not as much recently. They're just, it, it, it's more into biologics now. Uh, so these are adults with grass allergy. Um, uh, here's the pollen count. Here's the symptoms. They had placebo and active treatment. Uh, and this is the drug. So symptoms are better. Drugs are better. We know that grass pollen extracts work. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, do you need to give high dose or low dose? Their patients were randomized to 20 milligrams, it's actually micrograms of PhilP5, or low dose, which is 2 micrograms of PhilP5 or placebo. And the question is, which worked better? It turns out high dose uh, gave a better response than low dose. Also, fewer medications with the high dose. Um, it turned out that the high dose had a um, 
higher risk of uh, immuno of uh, systemic reactions than low dose. So there's always a trade-off. You get better effect, but you also are more likely to have systemic reactions. That's why we don't give astronomical doses. We want to give optimal doses. So the optimal dose for grass is between 1,000 and 4,000 bioequivalent allergy units. Let's do it. 0.5 in 5, so there's 10 doses. 10, uh, 10 doses times 1,000 bioequivalent allergy units, that's the projected effective dose, is 10,000 BAUs total in the vial. 10,000, but our vial comes as 100,000 BAUs per mil that from the manufacturer. Therefore, we only need to add 0.1 ml to the vial to get an effective dose. So that's what it looks like. We don't need a whole lot of Timothy. It's pretty strong stuff. And same thing with Bermuda. I'm not going to belabor the point. It comes as 10,000 rather than 100,000, so you need to give a higher amount. And so our extract vial has a lot of Bermuda in it because it's just not as concentrated. Okay. Okay, dust mites. Well, here's a study that looked at 0.7. 7 and 21 micrograms of DER-P1 as at a maintenance dose and whether it was effective or not. Um, this is efficacy. Patients, it's more effective at 7 than it was at 0.7 and it seemed to stay just as effective at 21, whereas the rate of systemic reactions increased as you increase the concentration. So again, uh, it was decided that maybe the 7 is the most effective dose because when you go up here you're getting a lot more reactions and you're not getting more beneficial effect. Uh, here's a study looking at 7 uh, micrograms of DER-P1 and 10 micrograms of DER-F1, kind of a mixture of the two. Uh, and it turned out that the active treatment group had significant improvements in symptoms, beta agonists and inhaled corticosteroids, and improved FEV1 and FEC. And um, active treatment group, uh, the percent of patients who got better was much higher in the active group than in the placebo group where most of the patients didn't get much benefit. Okay, so again, 500 allergy units is the effective dose that we want to give the patients. 500 times 10 doses, we want to give 5,000 allergy units. Our vial comes as 10,000 allergy units per mil, so we need to add 0.5 milliliters of the extract to the vial. So there we are. So now our vial has two cc's of all of this stuff. We still got room left over for more stuff, but you can see how it's starting to fill up. So there's a limited number of different allergens you can put in the vial before you run out of space and still maintain an, an effective dose of each component. Cockroach, it's the same thing. 1 to 10, uh, 0.5, 10 doses. 2.5. Cockroach is unstandardized, so we're basically doing the same thing with cockroach that we did for elm, maple, and, and ragweed. So there's cockroach, and we're doing the same thing with alternaria. Alternaria is also unstandardized, so all of these unstandardized things, you're going to just add 0.25 milliliters. Very simple. Cat. Okay, 28 cat allergic subjects with asthma. This was a Varney study in 97. Uh, maintenance dose of, point of 15 micrograms of FELD-1 uh, looked at response to cat house. They, they actually put them in a house with cats and saw how they did. Cat house. <laughs> uh, active treatment group had symptom reduction. Um, placebo didn't get better, whereas the active group got better. Uh, they also had reduced conjunctival and skin reactivity to cats. Skin test was smaller, and these people let them put a drop of cat extract in their eye, and then their eye blew up. Oh, God. People volunteered to do this stuff. I don't know. Um, so, again, patients who uh, got active in immunotherapy with cat got better, and the ones who got placebo did not. Uh, this is not uh, my Nanda or our Dr. Nanda. This was a different Dr. Nanda. Uh, this was a study of 28 cat allergic people, 15 micrograms of FELD-1. Then they continued it for a year, and they were also able to show that low dose didn't work. Uh, 0.6 micrograms of FELD-1 didn't work. Uh, 3 micrograms worked better. 15 micrograms worked maybe even a little bit better. So high dose works better than low dose. You, you have to give enough for it to work. Uh, and the reason that high dose was considered to be more effective is also skin test uh, reactivity decreased better with the high dose than with the low dose. 
Okay, so more consistent immune responses with the high dose. So we want to give 1,500 bioequivalent allergy units of CAT in order to be effective, uh, which is 15,000 BAUs. We've only got 10,000 BAUs per mil. So we're going to get one and a half cc. Now that's a big chunk, okay? So when they say the cat fills the bottle up, it does. Look at how much room the cat takes. You've got to leave room in there for cat if you're going to use cat. Okay. And then, oh, wait a minute. Okay, that was the cat. Oh, and dog. Uh, I guess I don't have a thing about dog. Oh, I need 15 micrograms of can F1. Now, how much can if one is in dog extract? <clears throat> well, this is a study that was done by Jay Slater. He's the um, director of the uh, Bio Office of Biologics for the FDA for allergen extracts. So, so he's at the FDA. And he measured the uh, micrograms per mil of major allergen in these unstandardized extracts. How much is there of Ole E1? Uh, in there, and there's, there's a lot. Birch and olive have a lot of the major allergen, uh, but English plantain, not so much. So that's much weaker uh, extract. Uh, it turns out that Alternaria didn't have very much Alt A1 uh, in its standardized extract. Um, and then Can F1, if you look at that, there's only five micrograms per mil of the major allergen. So not a whole lot of Can F1, the major dog allergen. But if you use AP dog, then there's a lot. What is AP? AP is acetone precipitate. They take the extract, they add acetone, which makes the water less polar so that these polar molecules that were in solution precipitate out. And then they take the precipitate and they redissolve it in aqueous. And that, that's enriched for CANF1. And so AP dog, um, I think there's one company that produces that is enriched for a, for a can F1. I don't know how much of the other allergens are in there. Though. There's can F2 and can F3 and all the other ones. So it may be that the patient is perfectly fine being treated with with uh, this low can F1 thing. But if they're only allergic to can F1, then the AP dog is clearly much better. So we need 15 micrograms of can F1 if the patient's allergic to can F1, which AP dog has 140. Uh, so that means that we need a little bit over a cc of the extract. So that's the dog. Dog and cat take up a lot of room in these extracts. And then, of course, there's a little bit of diluent because it has to add up to 5 cc. So we, we, you could have just added a little bit more dog, I suppose, a little more cat. Okay. So that, that's how we make an extract, and if we make that extract and use it to treat our patient, then the patient is going to get an effective dose of each component. But how are we doing? Well, when Hal Nelson did a study looking at how allergists are doing, it turns out that, at, for Timothy at least, allergists were giving about the right dose. The effective dose is 15, and he looked at what, what they were actually giving, and it was 18, so it was pretty close pretty big range. Uh, ragweed 12, they were giving a lot more ragweed than they needed to and kind of overdosing on the ragweed. Uh, Dur P1, not, not too bad. Uh, Dur F1 was a little bit underdosed and cat was way underdosed, so allergists weren't treating cat very effectively. Okay, in terms of cross-reactivity, because we, we have to finish up, we're almost out of time for this particular talk, uh, there's usually not much cross-reactivity when you go beyond families of of pollens, but within uh, tribes or genera, the cross-reactivity is pretty high, a high degree of cross-reactivity within species of the same genus. And so, um, in, ter and in terms of uh, tr protease, this is something Bob uh, Ash actually reported from, he worked at Greer Laboratories as their director of research. Some extracts like alternaria and cockroach have a lot of proteases, uh, and these proteases chew up other proteins. So if you mix this extract with other extracts, there may be an interaction between the two, and it would digest it and, and cause the extract to be less as potent. And in fact, it came up with these recommendations. You can mix fungi with fungi and Mix, mix, fun, if you if you want to, you can mix fungi with anything. But if you uh, uh, have insects, uh, if if you have pollens, for example, and you mix them with insects or fungi, then they tend to break the pollens down. So you don't want to mix pollens with insects. Uh, same thing with fungi. You don't want to mix dog and dog hair because it breaks it down. And dust mite is also broken down by these things. Um, so it's just, just kind of a rule of thumb. We don't know if it actually reduces the effectiveness of the extract because maybe the T-cell peptides are preserved and 
It's less allergenic and more immunogenic, and it might actually be a better extract. But this is just something that was a big deal, and it continues to be a big deal. But I, I would challenge these results. I'm not sure that it's, it's really true. Uh, just a few final words. Um, there is standardization. These vials are labeled in terms of uh, maintenance concentrate, tenfold, hundredfold, thousand. These are dilutions from the maintenance concentrate. Uh, this is a one-to-one, -one, okay? One to ten, one to a hundred. This is volume per volume of the dilution of the extract. We tend to label the bottles also. Sometimes we label them bottle one, two, three, four, and five. Some allergists were lab labeling the one down here. You start with one, and then, but then if you only had four vials instead of five vials, you'd have a different number, so it's not consistent. So you want to label it from the high down to the low. And then this color coding was standardized because the colors were all over the place. But usually we start with the one with a four-fold dilution as the green, green like traffic lights go. Uh, then yellow is caution, and red is stop, and we need a fourth color, so we put blue in there. <laughs> I don't know. How long do these extracts, until they expire, uh, that's kind of arbitrary. We don't really know how long they're good for. We know that the more dilute they are, the less time we can probably give them before they expire, because they decay more quickly. So, But we usually don't spend a whole lot of time in these low concentration extracts. Anyway, most vials are good for 6 to 12 months. Um, in terms of treating uh, allergy shots, uh, you want local reactions. It turns out that if they have large local reactions, you can have them take an H1 blocker before they come in. Um, you can also decrease the rate or the dose of buildup for patient comfort, put ice on it, that kind of stuff. But it, it's a pretty common thing, and the presence of local reactions does not necessarily predict subsequent systemic reactions. We, we used to think that it did. And then if they have a systemic reaction, it, it doesn't happen very often. But it's certainly possible, but mostly it happens within 30 minutes. It is possible to happen more than 30 minutes afterwards, and so some practices have patients carry epinephrine with them after they leave the office. Our, our group does that, but a lot of groups don't. Um, these are factors that increase your risk. If you have some symptomatic asthma, if you're very sensitive to the allergen, if you're on a beta blocker or ACE inhibitor, if you make a mis if you give the wrong dose, that, that could do it. Um, pre if you've had a reaction before, then you're likely to have another one. Uh, new vials, sometimes the new vial is more potent than the old one because it's, it's fresher. Uh, and if uh, there's, during ragweed season, you're more likely to react during, to a ragweed injection. Uh, injection fatalities are really very rare, and Bernstein and the Academy of Allergy does a surveillance program, and they monitor it, and the rate of systemic react of, of, of fatalities is vanishingly low. There's estimated about two or three uh, deaths per, from immunotherapy per year in the United States. I, I always tell me my patients that and tell them that that's why we have allergy shots given in, a prac in an office where you can be treated because we have to put safety first. And, of course, if they have a systemic reaction, the treatment is up enough. And I don't need to belabor that. How long do allergy shots work? If you give allergy shots for three years, uh, according to Steve Durham, um, th then if you stop it, then there's a sustained uh, benefit after the three years is up. So we don't know how, if it's 20 years later, you're still sustained, but nobody can do a study that, that long. But we know that for several years afterwards, there's a sustained benefit if you've gotten allergy shots for at least three years. If it's shorter than three years, then the likelihood of a sustained benefit is not as good. And so that, that's why the recommendation is you give shots for three years and then you start having conversations with your patients about how long are we going to continue this. We could go an extra year to four years or even five years. And the families, it's a shared decision making with, at, that, at that point. But it's good to start having that conversation. Okay. so. That was a whirlwind tour of allergen immunotherapy. Um, we're kind of at the end of our time for the first hour, so uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Just uh, if you're out there in COLA land, send emails to me, and I'll be happy to respond to your emails. Here we can have discussions in offline, perhaps, and we'll post those online and on our YouTube channel. By the way, these conferences are all recorded. They're all posted on YouTube, uh, ACAAI COLA.
It's American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, COLA, C O L A. So if you search for that, then you'll find our YouTube channel. You can watch all of these videos. They're usually posted within a week or two, not, not too long. And then you can put comments underneath and have a conversation. If you have questions, just post your questions, and I'll try to answer them. Thank you.